of all, we want to start by appreciating everybody for being here. Um, in terms of today's presentation, we um, you'll be, we'll be introducing ourselves real soon, but it's this idea of, I know it's a little bit of a different title, but this idea of this amalgamation of researchers and practitioners. And long words, but hopefully uh, we're going to spend some time speaking on behalf of what do we mean by that and how does it relate to PESA. Um, to start off, my name is Steve Nakasato. I'm the principal in residence. Um, I've been in the department for 34 years, principal 18 years, and currently I am a principal in residence in the Office of um, Professional Development and Educational Research Institute. Um, I also want to, before I start, appreciate my co-presenter because um, as he introduces himself, got a huge conference coming up next week and I only asked him to share with me, I think Monday, you know, so <laughs> I give him credit for just being there today and not choking my neck. <laughs> uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Cedar. I'm Director of Education Partnerships with RTI International. And oftentimes when I talk to education audiences, I have to clarify it is Research Triangle Institute, not Response to Intervention. And, and we're a nonprofit organization headquartered in North Carolina with 4,200 employees around the world doing research, evaluation, technical assistance, and capacity building in education, health, industrial research, you sort of name it, we're doing that type of work. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to that the company has uh, allowed me to stay home to do this work, both here in Hawaii and across the world. Thanks so much. Okay. So in terms of today, um, what was important, as I kind of alluded to, uh, as Rich and I, this is not a seasoned um, presentation we've been working on it for a long time, but the idea of what we first shared, as we started to talk, we realized, you know, um, research practice partnerships for some people, <laughs> they're not too sure exactly what does that mean, and there are going to be different perceptions of it. So, we want to appreciate you for being here, but maybe first what we want to do is we're going to flip the presentation a little bit because of at the first description talked about making connections to ESSA. What we want to first do is maybe make some sense of, of what is a um, research response, a research practitioner partnership, and how does it apply to what you might be doing in your jobs today. So I'll start off by this. Um, when we first started talking about research practice partnerships, I know that the words make sense. I'll just let people kind of come in. Okay. Um, the words make sense, but the reality is there's a, there's a specificity to research practice partnerships, and we want to make sure that we take time to understand what they're for. When we deal with the jobs that we face every single day, and I know we have some um, educational people, we have people from the community in this group, but there are two different types of basic problems, right? You have your technical kind of problems, for example, at the school level, what bus routes to minimize travel times for students. And these are big challenging problems. To calculate that out takes some effort, but that's a technical kind of problem. What we're gonna be talking about today, which is more important to us, as we learn, as I started to learn more about research practice partnerships, is that they deal with adaptive type of problems. Adaptive problems are those very, very complicated and comprehensive challenges that really take a lot of work to resolve. There's no way to really resolve an adaptive challenge. For example, how to improve the success of English language students of different cultures and languages. Not too many words, but really, to be able to resolve that of different cultures of different languages is hugely contextually challenging. Or the idea of how to change instruction to reduce the number of high school um, graduates who are placed in remedial college classes. It's not just a matter of changing a couple of things that is these are huge adaptive types of challenges that will take a long time. Which is why, as I learn more about research practice partnerships, that this specific, it's for those adaptive type of challenges. And the reality is, when we talk more about this research practice partnerships, I know I wouldn't feel awkward like, how come I don't really know about this? This is very, very new for me too. It's something that a few months ago I really didn't understand but I've, as I started to understand and talk about it with people, with people like Rich, I'm Rich, I started to get a bit better understanding, but more importantly, why they're important to go forward. And so oftentimes, yeah, it, it, when you look at the, the, the slide previous, it says, how do we define our problems? How we define our problems often helps to define what types of solutions we go after, right? And so if we kind of, treat complex adaptive problems as if there are technical solutions, 
that I can just make one tweak to the machine and I'm gonna get the output, then those are the types of solutions I'm going to look for. But if you actually reframe and understand these to be adaptive, to be complex, that there is not a ready-made solution to just buy off of the shelf, then we start to look for different types of solutions. So complex and adaptive challenges not likely to be solved, and we often engage in solutionitis. What's the next best thing that the vendor is coming in? And I always have to sort of preface, I'm in the company of the vendors, but we try to think very differently about how we present ourselves, that we are not coming to the table with solutions. We're coming to the table with processes that we think will help lead to improvements and solutions. So I guess it's important, as you kind of heard the idea, that we're not looking for these technical solutions for adaptive type of problems. The whole idea of it, maybe we've heard sometimes, I want to help improve um, student outcomes by raising test scores. That is not an adaptive solution. That is a technical kind of solution for raising test scores. Because we know those test scores that are raised are not necessarily going to match up or align to those instructional and assessment practices in the classrooms. So we know that when we talk about research practice partnerships, it's much more than doing something, being compliant about something. There's something in a sense where that we heard a little bit about this morning from Dr. Wagner, this idea of the sense of purpose. You're doing it for more than a reason of just for why I'm doing it for myself or just to make sure that I get a good evaluation. Mm -hmm. It's much deeper than that. It's the idea of this idea of working, not just for myself, but for others, to improve processes and products. The idea of really nurturing these trusting relationships or fostering site-based leadership. These are the deeper, more adaptive type of things that we're looking at in terms of when we talk about research practice partnerships. Collaborating and engagement, or that leveraging a social and cultural context, especially in this island of ours here. So, to continue, what we want to do is maybe just help get that, where again, we're focusing on this idea of what are research practice partnerships. We're going to ask you for just a couple of minutes to respond to these questions. What's one challenge that you or your school community? We're going to find someone to talk a little bit about that. But as you go through each of these questions, the next one, then describe what that, is it a technical or a complex adapt challenge? As you share, then continue on with the idea what progress has been made? What is the key to that progress? Or that idea, and then kind of move on to why is it still not solved or has it been solved by somewhere else? What is getting in the way of solving it in your community? So we're going to ask you to think of an adaptive problem that you're facing because everybody faces adaptive problems in what you're doing in your, in your jobs right now. Can you find a partner for just a couple of minutes and to start sharing that because we're going to try to take this a little deeper. Okay, can we do it in a couple of minutes? Okay, talk about types of challenges. And uh, I think what also comes out that's real obvious is that there is no real quick answer to those adaptive type of problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so if we continue to think about doing the same things over and over again, the same ways that we have been, then we sort of run into Einstein's definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. What, what we hope to do today is share with you a little bit of what Tony Wagner was talking about, what the governors talked about in terms of research and development, in terms of innovation. How do we pursue that so that we're actually learning something and be able to share what is learned and start to scale that across the state? So it requires a different way of doing it. And that's what we believe then to be research practice partnerships as one way to try and pursue that. The reason why we're trying to bring these very disparate communities together, researchers sitting in an ivory tower thinking about problems, coming up with research products that nobody else is reading. <laughs> Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Right? And on the other hand, you have teachers, counselors, principals, who are dealing with questions and problems every single day, looking for some type of help. Right? One of the quotes that I heard a couple of years ago at, um, at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching's Improvement Summit, presenter stood up and he said, the scale of our problems 
outstrips the capacity of any single organization's ability to solve it. So what research practice partnerships then is an attempt to bring communities of complementary expertise, experience, knowledge, information together to try and solve these problems. Because we as researchers, I would like to say we as a community recognize we don't have all of the answers. I'll amend that and say there's a small community of researchers who believe that we don't have all of the answers. <laughs> and at the same time, if educators had all of the answers, we would already have the best school system, not only in the United States, but around the world. So what I heard Rich talking a lot about is this, a different type of partnership. And the hard thing is, the reality is partnerships are precise. And it took me a little time to kind of understand this a little bit more, that there are different levels. And a lot of times when you talk about partnerships, it becomes confusing because you're talking about it at different levels. For example, when some partnerships are just basically at that sharing, that idea of networks of professionals sharing ideas and information. And a lot of times you see this maybe at a faculty meeting where you're asking for teachers to give some feedback. At a higher level, that's going to require a little bit more commitment, because you're going to hear that over and over again, is that idea of cooperation. Well, it sounds like a partnership, but it's really helping the state members accomplish their separate individual goals. And it's like the idea of maybe having a complex of teachers getting together and talking about a common issue. That's more of a cooperation, because you're still going to go back to your schools and you're going to do your different things. One level a little bit higher, We're not because we're talking about partnerships here, with the, um, that level of partnership. Coordination where you're working on, uh, you're working separately on shared goals, similar to like your PTG or your PTA at your school levels, where you're both agreeing that you have, we're going to raise funds, but you're doing it kind of, you have a sh shared goal, but you're going to do it differently in terms of that. Or if your PTO is running a parent activity, it doesn't mean that all of your teachers are all uh, quickly, I mean, tightly tied together and all being a part of that. You kind of go separately. Collaboration a lot of times is confused when we talk about partnerships. The idea of working together toward a common goal but maintaining separate resources. And I used to think that's the same thing as a partnership, but I, the connection I kind of make it is sometimes when you think about maybe like an annual special education meeting, where you do have this common goals, everybody's going to work together, but do you use the same resources? No. Parents are going to continue with what they do at their school, if you have other, other um, members, but it's, a little, it's not as precise as it could be, or maybe a 504 meeting, or, or just a parent meeting with a challenging child after school, or more of those collaborations. The partnerships we're talking about are specific. The idea that they're shared common goals. You're going to have shared decision making together, and you're going to, it's within a single entity. And a lot of that, you'll see that through examples of schools, through the PLCs, the professional learning communities, where they're actually learning together, coming together, common goals, and really producing like, you know, learning together. So another way to think about this continuum, that we often use a single term of partnerships, but it's a continuum of engagement. And we think about it in terms of the different types of interactivity that Steve talked about, the decision making that exists between those coming together and the expected outcomes. And then the sharing, you know, we all go to conferences, right? And at those conferences, a presenter sits up, dispel our knowledge upon you, we all go our separate way. Right? Not real meaningful, but there's some value to those types of activities. It's done in this collaboration and partnership space that we believe there's real opportunity. And it's really getting into that partnership space where we think there is a unique culture shift for everybody involved. Because in the collaboration space, I as a researcher come to the table, you tell me your question, I go back and I try to answer your question. In that partnership space, we're actually saying, okay, what can you do utilizing some research skills to help answer these questions? What can I do to come into the, the practitioner space and engage in those activities? It's letting go of our traditional silos of expertise and engaging in a third space. Our friends at the Carnegie Foundation say, 
researchers, practitioners, we all come together and we all become improvers. I'm no longer just purely a researcher. I am somebody who comes with researcher expertise, engaged in improvement work. And that's where partnerships, we use these terms so casually that they often lose meaning. And I think that has been so much of the rewarding conversation between Steve and I in really trying to tease out what these terms actually mean and starting to change conversations the way that practitioners engage with the researchers. If you want to be my partner, here are my expectations. And when we as researchers say, we want to be partners, you sort of go, well, what does that actually mean? Are you just wanting my school for your publication? So we understand brain research and we know you just had a lunch and things are digesting right now. So we know we have to get a little bit of talk, a little bit more talking about it. So we're trying to slowly as we go through this afternoon, get a little bit deeper. But to do that, we're gonna ask you again with the same partner or partners. First question, the idea is starting off with what are some partnerships in your school? Not everybody had them, but I'm sure there's some. What are some partnerships that better described that um, better described as collaborations versus coordinations versus cooperations? What are the um, what made um, these in, um, engagements successful? And then finally, obviously, the next question would be what were some obstacles to make these engagements work better? So got, I'll leave the questions up here, but if you can, we'll give you a couple of minutes to talk about these questions because we want to take it to the next level. Okay, and this should not be just researcher type of partnerships, any type of partnerships that your schools or communities might be engaged in. Talk. Yes. How many people have been in part, true partnerships then? One, two, three, four. The way you see Yeah. Good. We we'll appreciate that because as we now, as we see that there's a progression to what we're talking about, the question comes up: What are research practice partnerships? We understand partnerships, a little bit of a different definition. But research practice partnerships, as we said at the beginning, are not just for any type of technical kind of problem. They're very specific for those adaptive type of problems. And probably, again, as I mentioned um, a couple of months ago, I didn't know what a research practice partnership. So I don't know why I'm talking to you guys about this because I'm only a couple of months ahead of you, but. I did read and I did go to a training and probably if you Google research practice partnerships, the first thing that's going to pop up is this article and it, this is where a lot of the information that we're sharing. So obviously we're not talking from actual doing it right now, but this is where the research is coming up and by the time we finish today, we'll go into why, why this is important. So let's talk a little bit about what are research practice partnerships. Yeah, and one thing that I'll mention is the plug for the conference next week. So if you notice that document, it was funded by the William T. Grant Foundation. The Vice President for Programs, Vivian Tseng, is going to be the keynote speaker at next week's Hawaii Educational Research Association Conference. And the title of her keynote is Creating a Learning, Creating a Learning Environment with ESSA. Right? So very much you know, practical to what we're trying to do and very much you know, on point with the role that research practice partnerships can play in that. So the theme of the entire conference for the third year in a row is around empowerment. Right? We believe that research practice partnerships change the power structure around knowledge and the processes to create knowledge. Oftentimes, we treat the practitioners purely as consumers. Don't do enough to actually leverage the knowledge that is created within the schools. And at the same time, far too often, educators are not actually consuming what it is that we have to offer because it's contextually not appropriate. So this gets to who owns the existing knowledge and expertise, who is empowered to create the knowledge and the evidence, and empowered to create expertise, and how are knowledge, evidence, and expertise actually used, right? We actually drew you know, a lot of this discussion around who owns it. You know, we'll give credit, you know, I'll give credit to Dr. Underwood, he's the president of the University of Guam. And he was actually talking about this 
more in terms of indigenous peoples. Indigenous people have often had knowledge, their own knowledge, pushed aside, and Western knowledge imposed upon them. And it's been very disempowering. And so he talked about, you know, we have a role to create knowledge. We have a role in extending our knowledge and expertise. We can own this as well. It's not for somebody else to own. And we thought that this was actually a very powerful idea that extended beyond just indigenous communities. But this actually existed for educators, for community members, for parents, strangely enough, even for students themselves. So a lot of times you've been hearing about educators, practitioners, and I just want to make sure that I kind of highlight that I used to call myself an educator, but I considered only the school people as educators, but that's a little disrespectful because educators realistically are parents, they're researchers, they're everybody. So I'm referring to myself at, from the school side, as school side people, as practitioners. And as Rich kind of mentioned, it was the importance of being able, that's why I really started grabbing onto this idea of research practice partnerships, accepting the importance of just the practitioners and the educators working together who are closest to the problem to really resolve it. I didn't want someone from another state telling me how to resolve and fix um, um, student problems at the school. It was the idea that practitioners may not have, but it was also acknowledging the fact that as a practitioner, even though I worked and went back and I got my doctorate degree and all that, I was not real comfortable doing a lot of research type of stuff at the school level. It's just really, really hard to do, when, and those of you who are practitioners at the school level, it is impossible when you're dealing with the amount of supervision and the, and the context of what's going on. So the reality is I had to accept that I will need to believe in research, but it's just really, really difficult for me to do it at the school level as I talk to my colleagues still. So, no, I'm going to skip this slide. Okay. <laughs> and that was a slide he added last night. <laughs> just so much so, And so with researchers, you know, there, there is no shortage of journals and journal articles that are out there. I'll be honest, I don't read them all. There's just not enough time or energy to do so. And most oftentimes, it's because it's not relevant to what I'm working on, right? And so if it's not relevant to what I'm working on as a researcher, how can we researchers expect it to be relevant to what you're doing in schools, in classrooms? an unreasonable expectation. And so too often we find research findings aren't accessible either in its language or in its, or in its applicability to the questions and problems that you're asking. So why bring them together? Again, bringing our collective expertise together to create new knowledge, to create an, a true understanding of what's happening in the school, and at the same time, answering your questions, right? And I think that's, that's a huge paradigm shift for re the research community. We're not going in with our questions for which you are the subjects, but instead we're going in and engaging in the hard conversation of what are the problems that you're trying to solve? Where is it that more information would be useful in solving these problems? makes us as researchers very uncomfortable as a whole to have to do that because we're giving up control and it's asking us to engage in processes of teasing out okay so i hear you're you're struggling with your english learners what does that mean right and it's a very long iterative process to actually tease out what it is that we're talking about and what is it that research and analysis could actually help to answer. So, this I'll ask the group, because I know we're gonna do the group discussions, but think about it, I'm not asking you as a whole group right now, because we're one group right now. Has anyone been personally, or has your school been involved in a research project? Can anyone raise their hands? Who, has anyone out there been involved in an actual research project at your school level? And you can raise your hands. Okay, so a, a few. 
idea of how did you or your school engage in the research? Let me ask those people who raised their hands. What was the engagement considered? I mean, was the engagement considered a partnership? I see, mind if I kind of point it because I see kind of not. Can you tell us a little bit, what was that that you experienced? Well, Ms. Allison, oh. it's me oh, sorry. Oh. doesn't matter. Sorry. <laughs> so our researcher was a school team member already. And so that was, I guess, a little bit different because she was in your program, right? So it, when it was somebody that had been at the school for 10 years and already had the relationships and then was doing the doctoral program at the same time, it, it was a little bit different to have an internal researcher, I guess. Okay. And I know I saw you saying no. Could you tell us why? Um, because it was a partnership in that the school agreed to do the research with us. But it was not a partnership because we came in, showed them what to do, and took the information and walked away. I appreciate the honesty on that part there. Okay. And again, so we have different versions of it, and as you kind of mentioned, Leslie mentioned, it's different if it's an internal issue. So what we wanted to kind of bring up, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, is that research practice partnerships are very, very specific. I know what's the difference between a research pr practice partnership from one to another? where there are five basic things that's got to be there. This is not, you got to have three out of five. One, they have to be long term. If it's a complicated problem, it's not going to be resolved with a technical solution. It's going to take a while. What's and long term? I'm sorry? What's long term? So, yeah. yeah, so yeah. examples of these research practice partnerships, the most notorious one, and it may be only notorious to the research community, is the Chicago Consortium for School Research. That has been in place since the mid-1980s, continually engaging with the school district. Where, where are the pressures taking place? How are dynamics changing? And it's interesting where you know, the genesis of the Chicago Consortium came from. The state legislature in Illinois came in and imposed a huge decentralization process on the Chicago public schools. And they said, and the legislature said, how are we actually going to know if this is going to make a difference? And out of that, the University of Chicago, Northwestern University, the researchers stepped up and said, maybe we can help. And so you see these types of, of, of longer term partnerships in Chicago, in Baltimore, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Some are very much in their infancy, sort of in their first year, um, but many of them now are in their first and, and second decades of, of operation, and Chicago now in, into their third decade. So, you know, it's, it's understanding that we're in this for the long haul, and to Steve's point, none of these problems are getting solved overnight. The second thing is, and we heard it from Dr. Wagner too, it's got to be focused on some kind of problem or practice that everybody agrees to. And we have to be very defined as to what that problem or practice is that we're all committed to working on. It's the idea of committed to mutualism, and Rich is going to talk more about that pretty soon. Kind of a new word for me, but I understand it. But again, like partnerships, there's a little bit more detail to it. <laughs> what I really like is this idea that it's, I know what I would forget often is this intentional strategies to foster partnerships. Fostership, um, partnerships are not just natural things that happen between the researchers as well as the practitioners. Explicit efforts to be able to make sure that it not only exists, but it continues to grow as the relationship changes. And the fifth part that it, you need to make sure that you have is that you're producing some kind of original analysis. You're innovating, you're coming up with something new because of this collaboration, this partnership between the two parties. So, so to the mutualism. Yeah, so what do we mean by mutualism? You know, it's sort of this egghead word, you know, sitting in, in journal spaces. And, and I think, you know, in trying to distill what it actually means, it, it's shared ownership of the problem as well as the solution finding through jointly developed agendas. One side doesn't own the agenda more than the other, but it's coming to the table and negotiating back and forth. What is it that we're trying to answer? What is it that we're trying to solve? It's the shared sense of urgency to improve outcomes. That has probably been the biggest disconnect between the research community and practitioners. Practitioners know that 
the time that these students have in their classrooms, in their schools, within the system is finite. At most, it's going to be 13 years, right? But hopefully in that classroom, it's just the one year. So how can I actually make a difference for these students today? Researchers, and you know, whenever we publish this thing, it'll get published and we'll get it out there and you know, maybe somebody will use it. Oftentimes working on a completely different timeline. So it's the shared sense of urgency to solve the problems as quickly as possible. Jointly participating in these cycles of inquiry and inter iterative work. So we heard Tony Widener talk about iteration. Innovation doesn't just happen in big spurts. It's iterative. Trying, trying something, learning from it, moving quickly from what we've learned. And finally, and probably most of all, valuing the expertise of all of the partners. Everybody brings expertise, experience, and knowledge that are critical to answering these questions. And it's letting go of our territoriality over whose knowledge and expertise is most important, right? This is what we mean by moving into this third space. Because no longer is this my domain, we're now creating a space for our domain. We'll go to the types of RPPs. So many different models of what these research practice partnerships look like. Um, the Chicago Consortium looks most like research alliances. Distinct roles, I would actually say that the Chicago Consortium is much more of a collaborative. I think they're starting to move much more, much more into the partnership space where the researchers are deeply engaged in the schools solving the problems through technical assistance and local school capacity building. But for a long time, it was much more of a collaboration. We'd agree on the question, we'd retreat to our respective camps and do our work. Design research, build and study solutions. Um, so a lot of the design-based implementation research that we see taking place right now is particularly around curriculum. So there's a group out of the University of Colorado that is engaged in STEM curriculum development. Right? So how do we actually make this work? We talk about NGSS, but what does that actually look like in terms of meaningful curriculum? And finally, network improvement communities, or NECs. Uh, this idea, again, comes out of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Uh, Tony Bright, who comes out of the Chicago Consortium, recognizing the value of communities coming together and creating something new, right? And the, the improvement part, they borrow from healthcare, improvement science, right? So very rigorous efforts to improve a specific problem of practice with very clear aims in a time period that is very well specified. So they often say, some is not a number, soon is not a time. It's what exactly are we shooting to do? And then working very quickly through an understanding of the system to then make iterative changes based on our understanding of the system and building the capacity of everybody involved to make those improvements. And the network part is, it's not enough to make a change in one classroom. We probably all know of something fantastic that is happening in a classroom somewhere here in Hawaii. Our biggest challenge is that there is not enough learning taking place and trying to figure out what is that one great thing that's happening in this classroom, how do we scale that so that it's across all types of classrooms? Not in exactly the same way, but how do we take those ideas that are proving to work and get them to work elsewhere? And so the network part is an effort to accelerate the learning that's taking place in the system. So we're kind of getting closer to them. And as a practitioner, what was important to me to start to understand this more is 
it's hard to look beyond the classroom. And I know a lot of examples that are out there, like your ESSA blueprint to create a robust environment. I love this idea of comparing improvement versus compliance. That's always kind of the issue kind of coming up. But we, I don't really know what that is as a practitioner yet. There are different levels. I think there are hybrids of what Rich is kind of sharing that as we kind of maybe start to bring it down to more of a local level at the school level, at the organizational level. But I think this is up and it will start to come up and maybe some of our questions will be coming up. Yeah, and I would, you know, the one thing, you know, hit, it probably hits a little bit closer to home. Um, how many folks are familiar with the four tiers of evidence that are in ESSA? And Chuck and Jen are not allowed to raise their hands <laughs> and answer this question. But how many folks are familiar with that there are four tiers of evidence for consideration? And what that actually means? Sort of, kind of. <laughs> I'm aware that they are four. I'm not sure how to do it. Yeah, and, and so if I were to say that the strong measure of the, the strong research evidence, tier one, involves randomized control trials and experimental design, yeah. sure. does that have any meaning to most of you? Mm -hmm. I hear sure behind me. <laughs> Very sarcastic <laughs> tone. <laughs> This is where we, we believe that researchers can kind of help in and decipher some of the gobbledygook that the policymakers are trying, with the best of intentions, trying to make the best of what we know, but in the process of doing it, sort of has fallen back on researcher jargon that doesn't actually have very much relevance to practitioners. Can you, can you give an example of Research practice partnership is I'm still having a hard time. I mean, I understand the idea, but I don't have a tangible example of that. Yeah, so, so I give the example of the Chicago Consortium uh, that's taking place in, in Illinois. And one of the big problems of practice that, they're un that they've been undertaking over the last five or six years is this college readiness. You know, and, and they call their project the to and through project, right? So looking back and understanding how is it, where are we losing students, number one? But number two, what are the key characteristics in course taking, in attendance, in their everyday interactions in schools that are getting them to the point of being ready and able to graduate from high school and enter post-secondary if that's where they choose to go? or effectively into the workforce. And what they've actually found is we can actually trace some of these things back into elementary school. We know by fifth grade some real key indicators where kids are not going to get to and through high school. They're not even high school ready. And we're having conversations about college ready. Right? The Baltimore Consortium was trying to you know, take on the, the question of, of low student achievement. And what they found as a really big indicator, and, and it's probably what helped to inform the use of the indicator here in Hawaii in the school accountability system, is chronic absenteeism. And when they tried to then unpack, well, what is the nature of chronic absenteeism, they actually were able to go back and say, preschoolers suffer from chronic absenteeism. And those students who are chronically absent as preschoolers are most likely going to be the ones who are chronically absent in kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third grade. Through no fault of their own, and in many ways through no fault of the schools themselves. But when the schools then were able to interact with the communities and talk about, you know, missing 15 days, here and there has some real consequences. And when parents understood what those consequences were, we started to see very different changes. And so all of these different partnerships, they're taking on slightly different questions, but most of them are centered around trying to improve, one, trying to understand the nature of the challenges. So unpacking. 
And then once it's unpacked, once we understand the system a little bit better, then moving in the directions of, now we're gonna implement some interventions and see if those work. So when you say Chicago Consortium or Baltimore Consortium, who are the players involved in the partnership? So in Chicago, it's the Chicago Public Schools and the University of Chicago. In Baltimore, it's the Baltimore <laughs> City Public Schools, Johns Hopkins, and I forget the other university. So Hawaii would be our view when working with higher education? Well, you know, I think that is something that we at RTI have been working to change. Because traditionally, this has been relationships between public school systems and university researchers. And we're trying, as a nonprofit organization, trying to step forward and say, that's not the exclusive domain of university researchers. And oftentimes it's because university researchers still are operating under traditional incentive structures. Young researchers need to publish, right? That's what they're driving towards. In the nonprofit sector, yes, we would like to publish, but it's not what's driving us. But those of us at UH are, are happy to say <laughs> that, yes, we would be part of a partnership like this. Just want to <laughs> say that. For the yes, to all fairness, to the University of Hawaii. I'm just wondering, this might be an example. Um, there's a foundation in Hokkaido, Japan, for the research and part of preservation of Hindu culture and language. As part of their development uh, or stage, I guess, they reached out um, <coughs> to Hawaii. Um, they've been reaching out to various places, but um, looking at, from a practitioner point of view, how our Hawaiian language immersion schools um, are doing what they're doing. So, in a recent um, introduction, pre visit, and then um, bringing students both at the high school level as future educators and then university students as the research um, level of where they're at, bringing them together with the practitioners here in what um, again um, as the principal, the teachers, the students all interacted. I'm not sure at this point where it's going to lead. It sounds like or seems like that would possibly be an example of all that didn't involve our delve more deeply is starting to institutionalize the interactions between the university and the folks in Japan and the folks here, right? So probably what's taking place in Japan is much more institutionalized, and they're collaborating with the folks here in Hawaii. What did you know? What do you learn? What might we learn from this? But essentially, they might be going back and engaging in the work themselves, right? Practitioners. With their respective practitioners, right? And and so it sounds like what's taking place in Japan is probably much, much more in that partnership mode. Their interactions with the folks in Hawaii might be a little bit on on the coordination and collaboration. I think we're kind of transitioning, obviously, to the question parts because we need to make sure we get in that part. So I know I'm putting our contact information out there, but. If we can continue with the, because um, I know we don't have too much more time, but continue with the questions. So what is the um, incentive, motivation for the nonprofit RTI to 
process of the process. Yeah, so I think we kind of said a little earlier, and then Wagner kind of brought up, yeah, we know that there's always what's in it for me. But when we're talking about research practice partnerships, we're talking about something much bigger. We're talking about something that's hopefully that carries more weight in terms of our sense of purpose of what we're trying to do to improve our systems. So I know, yes, we're not getting that particular funding, but are there types of new learnings and opportunities that are going to come out? We're looking for those types of situations to start research practice partnerships. Yeah, and for, I can only speak for why I'm with RTI and, and why we are actively pursuing and engaged in this space. And it goes back to our mission. And our mission is to improve the human condition by turning knowledge into practice. And all of my colleagues at RTI, this isn't just, it's not just a catchphrase. It's not just something that we put up on the wall. This is actually something embedded within our DNA. Right? To make a difference. And it, and recognizing, you know, when you get a PhD, your dissertation is about making a contribution to the field of knowledge, right? And that's all fine and good. And, there are gonna, and, and, and there's a need for that. And researchers, we're always going to need researchers to engage in that work, to, to, to push the frontiers of knowledge and what it is that we know, or maybe what we should know. I think for, for many of us at RTI and many of my colleagues at the University of Hawaii, it, it's about making a difference in our communities. And, and I think that's what separates, and, and I, I would say that any practitioner wanting to engage with researchers or any researchers who are coming to you, vet them, and vet them hard. Because a lot of them are going to come in and say, yeah, we want to make a difference for you. Well, do you have a prepackaged solution? Is this the way that we're going to do this? Right? I would caution anybody who comes in and says, we have a research-based solution. What's that mean? Where was that research done? Right? If, even if your research practice, even if you're a partnership with researchers, is to, in some ways, serve as a good housekeeping seal of approval. You know what, we had this vendor come in, he says all of this is research-based. For what you understand we are trying to do, does this make sense? The researcher putting on their skills cap can sort of then help tease that and break it apart for you. But I think for us as a nonprofit, it, it, it's about improving the human condition. It's, a, it's about improving the quality of education. So, so kind 